Good day, everyone, and welcome to this Lightbend webinar for July 25th, 2019, titled Akka and Kubernetes, A Symbiotic Love Story. My name is Oliver White, Chief Storyteller and MC at Lightbend, and joining me today is my colleague, friend, and favorite co-author, Hugh McKee. Hugh is a developer advocate, O'Reilly author, and major globetrotter speaking at conferences, jugs, and meetups from Lightbend. While I introduce today's session, which has a lot to cover and should last the full hour, I'd like to ask our audience a quick poll question. Which of the following Akka toolkit components are you using in development or production? Loosely defined, symbiosis is described when two or more entities rely on close cooperation and interdependence to the greater benefit to all. I thought of a few examples here, like peanut butter and jelly, water with lemon, and chicken biryani with raita. By comparison, a non-symbiotic relationship could be that stomach inhabiting alien from the movie Alien, since that relationship could be considered short-lived and hardly beneficial to both parties. Now, as far as symbiotic love stories go, we don't often hear much about these in the computing world, at least until now. And honestly, it doesn't really get much better than the symbiotic relationship that we should all be taking of advantage of between Kubernetes and Akka, namely one of Akka's best features, Akka Cluster. For those of you out there not using Akka Cluster as part of the Akka Toolkit, this is an amazing module that allows you to build distributed applications with services that span multiple nodes and even data centers without having to worry about concurrency, message delivery, data consistency, and so on. Ever since its initial release in 2013, Akka Cluster has been searching for a node management system to handle Akka nodes and to provide a resilient and elastic infrastructure platform. Now, with Kubernetes, Akka can finally engage in that mutually beneficial relationship it's been waiting for. And this is what Hugh is here to show us today. We'll take a look at how Akka and Kubernetes work together using live crop circle visuals to help, and we'll specifically review how Akka cluster gracefully handles nodes leaving and joining a running cluster while continuing to run without interruption to any services, how Kubernetes adds and removes nodes as needed to adjust capacity or to recover from failures, and how both tools work together using a live representation of a microservice deployed across multiple nodes to demonstrate scalability, resilience, and message handling. All right, thank you for your votes. Just a little bit of housekeeping. As always, today's webinar is made possible only by people like you encouraging your company to become one of Lightbend's hundreds of happy customers, like our client Tubi TV. Tubi TV is a fast-growing online platform that lets you see ads in order to get one, uh, thousands of free movies and TV shows across various OSs, devices, and so on. They're looking for a senior Scala engineer to join their headquarters in San Francisco. So if that sounds cool to you, you can find out more about this position and other open positions with Lightbend customers on lightbend.com under the About tab. As always, today's webinar is being recorded and will be shared with you via email next week. If you have questions, add them to the GoToWebinar control panel under the Questions tab, and we'll see if we have time to get around to them today. If you're an existing Lightbend subscriber, then hopefully you're aware that you can reach out directly to our Akka and other expert engineers through the customer portal, where you can ask any additional technical questions, what ifs, how tos, and best practices. Okay, thanks for listening to me. Uh, that's all I have for now. Let's hand it over to Hugh McKee. Hi, Hugh. Thanks for joining us, sir. Hey, Oliver. Thanks. Um, I have to admit, I don't, I didn't know which one of those food groups that you mentioned. Uh, in the beginning. Chick, chick, chicken biryani with raita? Mm, yeah, I yeah, recommend yeah. it, sir. I recommend that one. All right, I have to look it up. All right, so thanks. And welcome, everyone. I appreciate you taking the time to listen in. Um, as as um, Oliver mentioned, um, I'm a developer advocate at Lightbend. And um, one of the things I often talk about is Akka, because I guess I really like Akka. I, I, before I came to Lightbend, I had the pleasure of, of using it and I really fell in love with it. And I did do some things with Akka clusters. I became a huge fan of that as well. But the, the challenge we often ran into was the, the platform that, that Akka ran, ran on, or the, the environment. Like when I used Akka clusters, we were running on you know, you know, regular VMs running on machines and uh, we had to manage all the VMs and so on. 
And then Kubernetes brings a whole new way of doing things that's pretty spectacular that, that we want to cover here today. So again, we're going to be talking about ACA and Kubernetes, but of course, you know, Lightbend is a company behind a number of other open source things, including the Scala programming language, the, the Play web framework you know, for web services, um, both uh, Java and Scala, and Lagam, which is a microservice framework, and again, all, uh, both Java and Scala. And of course, Akka has APIs for both Java and Scala. But really, the focus of this talk is this, there really is this love relationship that Akka loves Kubernetes, because in a way, um, Akka was built with a capability uh, way in advance of when uh, that capability actually existed, which was we needed a good orchestration layer to manage the nodes running in a cluster. And this is really what we're getting with Kubernetes. So I wanted to kind of take a few minutes to go a little bit over Akka and, and, and a little bit over Kubernetes as well. Uh, and we'll get deeper into it, but I wanted to set the stage a little bit. And you know, starting with Akka, uh, just for, for those that may not be that familiar with it, even if you are, this I think this is uh, a really concise definition of the actor model that I found in Wikipedia. If you look up the actor model and, and go to Wikipedia, but I think it's like the first paragraph there. And when I saw this paragraph, I really liked it. I thought it was one of the most concise and precise definitions of the actor model that I'd seen. So I just want to walk through this kind of piece by piece, you know, sentence by sentence, phrase by phrase, just quickly. So the actor model is a, a mathematical model, which is a little scary, but let's not worry about that. A bit. But it's really a model for concurrent computing. And we'll get into what that means in, in a minute as well. But it, it does represent a system of actors which are universal primitives. And I kind of think of them as universal building blocks. And an actor is fundamentally different than typically the way we do things in regular software. Actors are implemented as classes, they're instantiated as instances of those classes. So they have that similarity, but the behavior of actors is different than your typical object. But it is a, a universal pr a primitive of universal building blocks. So a, a, an analogy I'd like to use is you can think of uh, actors as something along the lines of Lego blocks. Lego blocks are very simple in, in the things that they can do. They have a, a very distinct pattern and they have a very distinct way that they uh, can be plugged together, basically. And that's very much like actors where you can take Lego blocks and build something simple like this picture here. But they can also go crazy and people build these marvelous structures and devices and all kinds of things using Legos. And they're just building these elegant models. I grabbed this picture of a Lego castle off the internet. And it, again, it's we, this thing was built using fundamental building blocks, but you end up building these really elegant systems. And that's exactly the kinds of things that you can do with with um, with actors in an actor model. So the behavior of actors is a little bit different than the behavior, say, of a, the typical instance of a class as an object, where the only way you can talk to an actor is you can send it a message. And actors respond to messages. The only way actors do anything is in the response to a message. So when an actor gets a message, it can make local decisions. And some of those local decisions might be that the actor that received a message, the decision may be, I'm, this actor is going to create other actors and delegate some work out to them. That act, the actor in response to a message could send messages to other actors. And this one's kind of subtle, but it's really powerful. And it's one of the concepts that um, is, is really important to understand, but not initially. I think this is something that you kind of have to um, get a little familiar with the, the basic behavior of actors before you can kind of wrap your head around this. But the this part is determine, determine how to respond to the next message. So a, a simple example would be, say you have an actor, and actors can have a state, and an actor could be in a, um, an idle state. Say it's an act, you have a whole bunch of actors that are sitting out there, 
and they can be either idle or active. So when you send a message to an actor that's idle, how it responds to that message or what, how it uh, reacts to that message may be different than how it would react to, to that same message when it's active. So say you have you built an active system and you have this, you know, this actor that is idle, it gets a message that says, please do this work. So the actor switches from being idle to active. So we got a, another message saying, hey, could you please do this work? The response to that message would be, sorry, I'm busy. You know, I can't do it because I'm, I'm, I'm no longer available. And that's a very, very powerful thing that you can do um, once you get comfortable with the ways that you can uh, assemble actors in an active system. The only way actors modify their state, and this is pretty profound, is in response to a message, which is very different from objects in an object system. You know, with objects in an object system, you, know, you invoke a method which can change the state of an, actor, of, a, of, a, of an object. In the case of an actor, the only way an, an actor can change in any way is in response to a message. And an actor only acts on one message at a time. So the only way actors can affect each other is through messages. And this is gets back to the whole concurrency thing because this makes a very powerful uh, model for doing computation that avoids things like locks. So as an example, you, you say you have one actor that receives a message to do some work, but that actor is not gonna actually do the work. It's gonna delegate the work out to say some worker actors. So it creates, a, a, say a set of three or four worker actors and then the actor then sends a message to each actor, hey, you know, actor one, do task one, task two, task three, task four. So all four of these actors, these worker actors, are working concurrently. And when they're done, say they made, you know, say they send a message back to the requester saying, I'm done, here's the results. And then the, the parent actor the, or the supervisor actor, as it's called, then can send a message back to whoever asked it to do some work saying, all right, here's the results of my work. So for, from the perspective of the initial sender, please do this work, it looks like this one actor is doing all the heavy lifting, but in reality, it's delegated off the work to be done by other actors, and that work is being done concurrently without things like complicated thread programming and, and blocks and semaphores and, and all those types of things. So that's a, a really nice, concise, definition of the actor model. And this is really kind of a, a nice, concise definition of the actor model in the Nanaka. Kubernetes is, it was, is wow. I mean, um, especially for Aqua clusters, it's, it's major because Kubernetes is fundamentally, a, a, the way I look at it is a place to run my jobs. I'm a developer, I'm a Java developer. I build Java applications, you know, I, I put maybe build a big, big old jar that contains all my dependencies, and I want to run that jar somewhere. And, and please don't bore me with all the details. And, and, you know, for all of you that that are developers out there, you know, all the ceremony and everything that we have to go through to get things running in an environment, Kubernetes is really taking away a lot of that friction and simplifying things quite a bit. With Kubernetes, the idea is that you get a bunch of capacity, a bunch of machines. You know, it could, you know, ultimately, it starts at bare metal, probably some VMs. Those VMs have a certain amount of memory and they have a certain uh, number of CPUs allocated to them. So in Kubernetes, you, you basically describe those, all these, uh, they're called nodes. In Kubernetes terms, you describe all these nodes. Here's a node that has, say, 120 gig of memory and 16 CPUs. Here's another one, 120 gig memory, 16 CPUs. So the end result is that Kubernetes has this whole pool of computing and memory resources that it can use. So then when we want to run something, the, the unit of, of runtime is called a pod. And basically the characteristics of a pod is the pod says, I need to have the, this much CPU capacity and this much memory capacity. So Kubernetes job is to find some place in this pool of computing and memory resources to run a pod and that's just the tip of the iceberg of the types of things that Kubernetes does. It handles all the networking and it handles many, many other things that are way beyond my pay scale. I, I'm, I just want a place to run my job. And like, again, don't bore me with the details. So in addition to that, and we'll see, I'll show you some examples here in a little bit, 
the what we get is um, when you def you tell Kubernetes what you would like to run, you're, it's a declarative thing. It's not an imperative thing. You're not saying run this and then run that and run this other thing and you know, do this and do that. Basically, what you're saying is that this is what I want you to run Kubernetes, and you declare, you know, I want a pod with two CPUs and four gigabytes of memory, and then Kubernetes tries to find that. And in addition to what it will do is that it gives you a bit a, a level of elasticity and resilience where once you just declare this pod or pods that you want to run and Kubernetes has been told about this, if a, it started up a pod and it's already running and say that there's a hardware issue or a network issue or something breaks that it impacts the running of of a pod, the Kubernetes will detect that and it will restart the pod somewhere else in its available pool of hardware and capacity. Another really nice feature is auto scale. If you're running, say, on a pod or a few pods, you can say you're running a microservice or your, your app or whatever on it, and say there's memory pressure or CPU pressure, you can configure by again declaratively to say, I want to be able to scale up. If if the pods that I initially have running get overwhelmed, add more pods, and my and my application will take advantage of. This is exactly the kind of environment that Akka has been waiting for, and actually been waiting for since like 2013. So when uh, Akka cluster, I, th I think that was around the year that Akka cluster came out. So let me show you. Um, an example of what I've got is we're going to be walking through an example project that I've set up that is um, running on my laptop using um, MiniShift, which is the free version of OpenShift that you put on your, your laptop. You can also use um, Kubernetes itself, a Minikube is called. But let me just show you. So I, I've got um, Tight. I've got Kubernetes and OpenShift running. OpenShift runs Kubernetes, basically. It's a, it's a really nice management wrapper on top of it. So I'm going to, um, I can also do things like um, I've got some pods running. So I've got three pods running. And these three pods are running in an ACA cluster. So this is kind of boring looking at the command line. So let's look at it um, more from a console and from a visual way of doing things. So I, I said Minishift run the console, and it brings up a console, and this looks very much like the real console for OpenShift, but it's running on my laptop. And I've got this project that I've set up called Octa Cluster Demo 1. And I'm going to the console, and I want to go through and show you I've got this uh, load balancer set up, which I defined you know, through commands through you know, declarative configuration and so on. And basically, I've set up this load balancer and it set up a network around my Akka cluster. So in this project, um, I've got this visualization that, and all this you'll be able to play with and you know, clone the project from GitHub. I'll give you the link at the end of the talk. And you can play with this and run it on your own laptop. But this is a visualization. You know, Oliver mentioned crop circle. Some people call it a crop circle. Some people call it a, a flower. Um, but it's a way to try and visualize not only what's running in Kubernetes, but also what's running in Akka. So we're going to go through this in, in just a minute. But you can see it's it's alive. Hopefully, you can see it's moving around. Things are you know happening. You know, think you know, there's all kinds of different circles here and, and so on. So I'll, I'll explain all those in, in just a moment. So the crop circle. Well, the, the crop circle is an attempt, to, again, to visualize things. So starting at the ACA cluster and Kubernetes level, kind of at the most coarse grain, in the diagram, there were three big circles. And those three big circles represent uh, multiple things. First off, they represent a pod running in Kubernetes. So there's three pods running in this representation this visual that I'm showing you here. Each 
pod is running a Docker container. Now, a pod can run one or more Docker containers, but in, in most cases, you're running one Docker container per pod. But there are circumstances where you run multiple, but we're not doing that here. So in that Docker container, we're running uh, a JVM, which is the JVM for my this demo app that's running Aka cluster. All written in Java, so Java Maven project. So the circles, the most interesting ones, the ones that do the real work are the, the little blue ones on the perimeter. They're called entities. Now, each circle represents an, act, an Aka actor instance. So you can see there's, you know, there's I think roughly around 80 or so typically of these, you know, and that this is a you know a contrived example. Normally in the NACA system, you'd be running thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of actors. But in order, I can't show millions of actors you know, in a simple circle like this. So I kind of scaled it back to something that um, you know wouldn't be overwhelming. So each of these entity actors is where business logic is executed, and and we'll get into that uh, some more as we go through the. the the presentation here, but there, the, this is where the business logic happens in this this uh, sample application. The green circles represent shard actors. So again, each green circle is a is an actor instance, and it's called a shard. Now, shard actors are used to distribute work across the cluster. So in this demo, there's a fixed number of shards, and and this is always the case. So in this demo, there's 15 shards. So we'll always see 15 of these green circles, no matter how many pods we're running at, which are the big circles again. And the different colors, I just use different colors to kind of give me a clue as to what's running in each one of these pods, because there's some actors that run um, uh, one actor per JVM or, or node in the cluster. And um, the, the thing I wanted to show is that the light yellowish one is where the web client is coming in and coming into the load balancer it, i wanted to know where which http endpoint because there's an http endpoint at all three of the uh, nodes running in the cluster i wanted to know which endpoint that the client was coming into and then uh, also had a uh, kind of a visual representation the darker uh, circle represents where cluster singletons run and then finally just a vanilla one is is orange and then finally uh, the the little uh kind of pinkish poofing they, they kind of grow up and dim out like a star going supernova um these are uh, entity actors that are stopping they're shutting themselves down so what happens is there's there's a simulation running in this this sample app where it's simulating uh traffic and messages are being sent to entity actors. And if the entity actor doesn't exist when the message is sent to it, it starts. And you'll see those as dark blue circles. They're briefly dark blue to show that that's a new instance of an entity actor. And then while they're alive and receiving messages, they, they're light blue. And then when they stop receiving messages, the actor will shut itself down. So that's where you see it kind of poof out of existence. Now, what we're talking about here is we're running in a cluster with, you know, of, of JVMs, which is an ACA cluster, but this really represents a, uh, a microservice. And, and, and for example, Logon, when you build Logon microservices, this is exactly what's happening uh, internally. This is exactly how an, a Logon microservice works, where it will easily run in the cluster, it will scale across the cluster, and so you can imagine a system of microservices, what I'm trying to show here on the left, each one of these is running as its own independent um, actor system. So actors between these different microservices are talking to each other. It's only actors within a given microservice that are talking to each other. So let's go back to the, uh, the demo. So we got, we're running along here and we're, we're running with, again, there's 15 shards and a bunch of entity actors that are kind of coming and going, starting up and stopping. And then we, we're running on three, three JVMs and three Docker containers, which are in three Kubernetes pods. 
Now I can simulate a failure of a pod, the way I, this app is set up, you can click one of these bigger circles and that will send a message back, you know, back to the back end to tell that JVM to stop. So that's what I'm gonna do here. I'm gonna click one of these guys and we should see that guy go away. Here, there it goes. And now we're down to two pods. But then what we should see very quickly is we'll see the shards, the, there were five shards on that pod that went down and all of a sudden now they reappear somewhere in the remaining two, um, two pods running in the cluster. So this is Akka reacting very, very quickly to the loss of a node in the cluster. And then it immediately reacts to that and it redistributes the shards so that the end of the actor is that we're running on that node that just went down can can resume their work. They you know they're started up new and they recover their state uh, on the on the the new server. So the load is, that was distributed across three nodes it was pushed down to two. Now in the meantime, Kubernetes saw this happen. Remember a few minutes ago I said Kubernetes you know, it's declarative. We said, hey, Kubernetes, we want you to run three pods. So when it lost a pod, it, Kubernetes looks and goes, hey, wait a minute, I lost a pod. Let me restart one. So a, a third pod starts up, and now you can see the shards are gradually, it doesn't do it abruptly, you know, this is an Aka thing, but they're gradually moving back over to that new, that new node that joined the cluster. So this is pretty trick. I mean, a lot going on here, but the, um, you know, from a, the perspective of the service itself, again, let's say this is a simulation of a single microservice. The microservice was running along and all of a sudden it lost some capacity, but the service itself continued to work, continued to respond. Users shouldn't even see anything happen because all this happens, you know, very, very quickly within uh, a few seconds for the actors to recover and then a few more seconds for Kubernetes to recover and bring, the, bring us back up to, to capacity. So that's pretty cool. But say, for, as an example, the, this microservice is running along and all of a sudden it gets a spike in traffic and we need more capacity. Well, I'm gonna manually do this, but you can um, set this up to happen automatically where you can set it up to auto scale. So I'm going back to the uh, OpenShift console, and I'm going to go in, and there's a real nice screen here for seeing how many pods are running. It shows three pods running. So I'm going to simulate an auto scaling event where, say, we got a spike in traffic, and we are going to bounce up to, to five pods. So you can see Kubernetes is starting to react here in the little visualization where it's going to um, hopefully fire up a couple pods. There, there we go. And then back on this the visualization what we'll see in a moment is we should see two new pods show up now what's happening though behind the scenes right now as i'm talking is that kubernetes was told this fire two more pods so it starts up pods it's got to grab the docker images and start up the docker images then the docker images start up and then they run the jar that's defined to run in the jar and then the jar starts up and then the Java main starts up, and then the Java main is where there's some code for initiating what's called Aka Cluster Bootstrap. Now, what Aka Cluster Bootstrap does is it's, and this is a feature of Aka itself, which is just a couple lines of code for us to do as developers. It, as each node starts up, it does an API call to Kubernetes to say, hey, I'm, I'm, I've started up, is there anybody else? Are there any other pods like me out there? And if there are, Kubernetes gives back a list of those other pods. And then the new node uses that to then start to communicate with the existing pods and say, hey, I want to join the cluster. And what we should see here in a moment, hopefully, is you know, the demo gods are good to me, is that the we should see some the, the, the two new pods come in. I can see my my laptop is is uh, struggling with this. A little bit, but um, normally we'll see it come in pretty quick. And come on, Kubernetes, here we go. Let's, let's see. Of course, when everybody's watching, no, I've done this talk a number of times, usually it's, it's pretty quick. 
but we should see the the uh, the pods come in. So, anyways, uh, if anybody, if you if you've ever used um, Aqua Cluster before, there was a whole concept of static IPs and and uh, seed nodes and and things like that. Well, in the case of Kubernetes, everything is dynamic. You know, the, the whole network's dynamic. We don't know what IPs are going to be allocated to uh, different nodes in the cluster, and um, we we just have to uh, have a different strategy for it. And, and the strategy in this case is uh, it's using the the Kubernetes API. Wow, this is taking way too long to uh, to start up. I'm gonna have to move on in a minute if it doesn't show up. It doesn't up. it doesn't require a refresh, does it, Hugh? I no, it's all, it's constantly yeah. refreshing. It, it, yeah. um, and I got a little. I've seen I've seen you do this too. So. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it. And um, let me go back to the Kubernetes. release. Oh, they failed. That's not cool. That's what's wrong. Let me scale back. Oh, lucky, lucky us. It's, that's never happened before. Ooh. Now we get to see a live uh, debugging. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Let's try one more time. Is that an error that you've seen before? No, never. Interesting. How would you yeah. go about di diagnosing that? Oh, now, now they're running. There's a log log on each pod that you can grab. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of nice commands for, for looking at the logs. And, and usually the logs give you um, a good idea of what, what's happening. Um, let's see if it's uh, just give it a little bit more time and then I can move on. I think it's still running. Come on, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is the bummer. Because normally what we see is, you know, we'll see the two pods come in, and then we'll see some of these green shard nodes migrate back over to it. And what's odd is um, the uh, that one node restarted after I um, failed it. Oh, well. Sorry about that, guys. There are examples. It's like, I swear this works. And I've, <laughs> I've done this talk before. So if you look online, there, there's other conferences that I've, I've done this talk at that, um, that this is just worked flawlessly. But oh well, sorry. Let's go. There might Let's be a, a a bit of a misconnect because you're also streaming video and audio right now, so that can often yeah, that might be a um, problems. That's a good case to get a laptop up here, right? Indeed. So, yeah. So what really what this is demonstrating is what we've been talking about for years at Lightbend, which is reactive system. You know, we. Reactive has gotten to be a really popular term in the last few years, but often it's, you hear about it in the context of reactive programming, which is great. Reactive programming, asynchronous programming, things like that, which you know, which is fine. But it's, that's one thing. A completely different thing is reactive systems, and reactive systems are very um, fundamentally things like you know the, the, the system itself is always responsive no matter what's happening behind the scenes, where the system is always responsive when because it's resilient to failures and it's always responsive because it can scale up or down if, depending on the uh, variability in the traffic so this is the symbiotic relationship between the two you know where aka can handle things on the inside of the jvms with the actors but it doesn't have anything to handle running the jvms and this is where kubernetes comes in where kubernetes using things like OpenShift and, and Docker and so on, but it's really fundamentally Kubernetes is giving us that orchestration of our JVMs, running in Docker containers, running in Kubernetes pods. And that's the beautiful uh, relationship between the two. So 
Kubernetes probably could care less about Akka, you know, but Akka certainly loves you know, Kubernetes in a big way because it's really the orchestration layer we've been waiting for for quite a long time. So let's take a look at the, the project. So as I mentioned, this is, this is an example project that you can download from GitHub. And it's just a Java Maven project. It's got a palm. I'll show you this palm here. Um, you know, it's just got no, your normal dependencies, dependency, dependency, dependencies. And then it's got two plugins, Maven plugins, that I used here. One is called the Shade plugin, which creates the super jar the, or the jar jar. This is the jar that contains the application code, but it also contains all the dependent code, dependency code. So in this, we're just defining, you know, essentially you know, build the jar jar and here's the main class to run when that jar is started. You know, giving, it's just a class called runner. Another really interesting plugin that's pretty cool is a Docker Maven plugin. So if, for those of, you, those of you that use Docker, which it seems most people have these days, um, you normally would use a Docker file. Well, in this case, it didn't need a Docker file because I had a uh, plugin that takes the place of the Docker file. So here I'm saying, you know, we're going to build using um, the OpenJDK 8 Alpine GRE to find a few ports. You know, these are, you know, port 8080 is where the web client is coming in. 8588 is for ACA management and 2522 is for Aka itself to talk to, you know, to, diff, to each other, the different nodes to talk to each other across the cluster. And then here's the, 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 uh, the real kind of heart of it is where when this Docker image runs, it's instructed to run the jar, basically, the jar that was built by the previous plugin. And that's it. Pretty straightforward. So you do a Maven, uh, Maven clean package Docker colon build and Voila, you've got a, a, a jar that's loaded up into a Docker image and it's ready to be loaded into the Kubernetes. There's also a couple of Kubernetes files that I defined here. This, this is the main one, it's called a deployment. And I have to admit, I, I do not know that much about Kubernetes. I know enough to be dangerous. Again, I don't wanna know that much. All I wanna know is I have to run my jar, but here, I. I've got it set up where when this, when I deploy this application to Kubernetes, the declarative nature of this, this YAML file says, I want to run three replicas in my pod, because I want a cluster to start up with one, more than one node. That was just a, a choice I made. This could have been one, could have been, you know, however many I want. <clears throat> Another cool thing is you can do rolling updates, which is really nice. Another nice feature of Kubernetes where it'll, uh, do pod by pod by pod and roll through them. And then probably more in less interesting thing here is the um, the Aka, I mean, I'm sorry, the Docker image file that needs to be loaded to run in the pod. And then define some ports, you know, the ports that, that uh, Kubernetes needs to know to set up in the network and then does. And that's pretty much it. And of course, there's all the Java code. So the entity actors, the, the way they, this works is that, you know, I've got a load balancer set up in this app, which is typical. Again, you know, think of this as a microservice running in a cluster of, of uh, JVMs running out the cluster. So say you and me and somebody else were in our clients, um, you know, on a phone app or something like that, and we're hitting this back end microservice. And we're all going into a load balancer. So what I'm trying to show here is that the, some of the routing that happens, you know, the load balancer can drop the HTTP request anywhere. We don't know where it's going to drop it. Let's say you and me came into this node at, at the top left and um, somebody else came into the node at the bottom right. But what happens though is that you're dealing with, say, a shopping cart whose ID, whose entity ID is 64. I'm dealing with a shopping cart, just as an example of, a, of an entity whose ID is 17. What happens is that because of the way um, the shards map entities to them, this is all done through some kind of a hashing algorithm. 
typically a consistent hashing algorithm. But anyways, um, in my case, my HTTP request happens to come into the node where my entity actor is running in the same JVM. So the routing of a message, you know, the HTTP request comes in, we build an object as a message to send to that entity actor. All that routing happens within the same JVM. You, on the other hand, your HTTP request came into the same node that mine did, but it happens that your entity actor is running on a different node in the cluster. Now, this is the beauty of ACA. All the routing of the message from one node in the cluster to another node over the network, then through the JVM to your entity actor, all that's being handled by other actors that come out of the box from ACA. So this is what's called ACA cluster sharding. So this is really kind of an, an example of showing some of the, me the message routing and not the sharding. Now, the, the nice thing is that right now, the example I'm showing here running on four pods, four nodes in an ACA cluster. But say we scale back to three. Well, now things have moved around. You know, the maybe the our actors or or one of our actors was running on the node that shut down. So now your actor is going to have to be resurrected. You know, a new actor will be started to handle, say, your actor entity 64. So same type of thing. Your request comes in, now it comes into a different node. It happens to be your entities on a, on a you know, the top left node. All the routing is handled through ACA. Now this is exactly what ACA is built to do. Built to do message routing and forwarding and message delivery over the network extremely fast. You have millions of messages per second within a JVM and hundreds of thousands of messages over the network very, very quickly. This is exactly what I was made to do. So you might look at this and you go, oh my gosh, there's a lot of routing going on or doesn't this cause a lot of overhead? Well, when you run the app, my I've got logging in my uh, actors that show you response times in, in um, Nanoseconds, I think, I think they took it down to. Uh, so you, you, if you play with this, you know, take the app and play with it, get it set up and running, you can see um, what the actual timings really are to do some of this. So let's just take a look at the actual code. Oops, sorry. To do of, of an entity actor. So here's the entity actor in the project. And it's just written, it's just a Java class. In this case, it extends a uh, ACA base class. I'm using ACA untyped here. Now there's a new uh, ACA type that's available. Well, I haven't converted this project to use ACA type yet, but it's a new way of handling messages, which is pretty nice. But, you know, it's just a class, got some instance variables. Um, of a constructor that's given uh, this pass one argument, which happens to be a what's called an actor reference, which is the URL of another actor that this actor wants to communicate with. But this is my own design as a developer. But in in the untyped, there's one method that you have to implement, which is the create receive message, a method, and this is the one that defines how to route incoming messages to this actor. <clears throat> so you can see there's a command actor, I'm, I'm sorry, command message, a query message, and a timeout message. So these are the three messages that me as a developer, I wrote this to handle. And the routing is very simple. If a message coming into this actor happens to be a command object, then I'm going to vote the command method. If it's a query object, I'm going to vote the query method and so on. So let's take a look at the command method. The command method, you know, the, 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 I pass the message to that method. Now, what ha what I do in that method is up to me. And in this case, I'm, this is just a simulation. Normally, this is where you would invoke some form of persistence. And this is along the lines of uh, event sourcing, if you've heard of event sourcing before, um, where commands come in which are requested, you know, an intent to do something and commands uh, emit events, you know, one or more events, if, if they're changing something. So 
an event is a historical statement of fact, something that's happened in the past. Here, I'm not doing any persistence. I wanted to keep this demo simple and straightforward to set up. But I wanted to show you this. This actor, when it receives a command, it sends back a message to the sender and it invokes this tell method, which is the way Akka sends a message to another actor. And I'm building an object, I'm saying command act, and I'm just, which is an object I designed. And I'm, I'm, so I'm basically sending this command act message back to whoever sent me this message. Now, this actor doesn't know or care if the actor that it's talking to is running in the same JVM that it's running in, that this actor is running in, or if it's running in a JVM somewhere across the network. It doesn't care. That's all being handled by Akka. So we're running out of time, so let me move on with that. But that's basically it. I mean, actors are pretty straightforward. So <clears throat> the, you know, we have the, on the right, I'm showing the diagram, the visualization. On the left, I'm kind of showing the visual, the, uh, kind of a view of this from a pod perspective. So here I'm showing the cluster running on one pod, which is running in one Docker container, which is running one JVM. Same thing running on three pods, which is three Docker containers and three JVMs on the left. And on the right, the diagram shows the three big circles, which represent the activity happening in those three JVMs. And if we lose one of those pods, then we see, um, for whatever reason, it could be scaling back, it could be due to failures, you know, whatever. Uh, Akka doesn't care, all it knows is that you know, a node left the cluster. When, and again, this is kind of visual, but what happens is that, say when we run a, we're running on four on the left, four pods, and we drop down to three pods, we run go from four JVMs in the uh, cluster to three JVMs. Those three shard actors that happen to be running on that, that JVM that went down are redistributed somewhere across the, um, the cluster. And all these, all these circles, although you can't see them in these diagrams, they're, they have, you can see their IDs. If you mouse over them, the ID, the number gets bigger. But um, see, when, if you take this and play around with it, you can, you can actually see where things move around uh, visually as things happen. So one other thing I just want to do real quick and uh, kind of wrap it up is, this is concept that I really think is very powerful. I kind of, I like to call it cluster aware. And this is where actors know that there's instances of itself running on each node in the cluster. So I'm trying to show here, so we have a, this diagram is trying to show four nodes in a cluster. There's an, a cluster where actor running, an instance of it running on each node in the cluster. And they, they know how, because they know that there's an instance running in each node in the cluster, they can talk to each other. And this is what I used to build this tree because it, the way the visualization works, the visualization is just a, a JavaScript running in the browser. It's using D3GS, which is a very cool uh, JavaScript uh, framework for visualization. Um, but the, the back end, is sending up a uh, JSON tree of this whole tree um, to the client. But the, the question to ask is that, all right, as entities appear and disappear and things move around in this big, huge, single JSON tree, how does an entity actor say that is appearing it, where I'm showing the arrow, how does the tree get updated uh, no matter where the browser hits, because a, there's got to be an instance or a copy of this tree on all four of the nodes in the cluster and all four JVMs. So what happens is that when an entity actor starts up, it's set up to set a message, send a message to another actor that says, hey, I've started. That other actor gets the message and it updates its tree. So now the tree is updated with that new entity actor in one node. But the, the trick is, it's using cluster where this, this actor that's updating the tree knows that there's an instance of itself running on the other nodes in the cluster. So it forwards that message to its counterparts across the cluster so that they can update their tree. So this is a way, a, a way of keeping the trees 
updated across the cluster as things change. And just real quick, in the code, this is just a little thing that I invented when I wrote the code. Nothing spectacular here, it's just basic ACA stuff. So I, when that, um, the entity is null, that tells, that, that's a simple way that tells the code, all right, this is a brand new, the, the entity just started, the, the entity actor just started. And I invoke this method called notify start. Notify start builds a, a message called action. And it sends that message does do a tell to this HTTP server actor. And that's it. So that's the first arrow back in the diagram, uh, back over here, this first arrow. Oops. Sorry. There, this first arrow. The second arrow happens when we go to the HTTP server actor. So let's go to that. It's just another actor. It's got a create receive method. It gets an action message object. It invokes this action entity method that I wrote. It gets set, you know, so it's got the message. It looks at the action. If it's a start, it adds the entity to, to its this tree that this thing maintained. If it's a stop, it removes. And then it checks to see should I forward this on to my counterparts? And if it does, if it needs to forward it, then it goes to this forward action method, which <clears throat> is just going into a loop. And this is the cluster where part. There's an, an ACA object that you can get from the actor called cluster. And you get the cluster state and you can get the list of the members and I'm just foraging through each of, of the members in the cluster. And I check, is, you know, it's gonna make sure that it's not itself because it doesn't want to send a message to itself. It doesn't need to re-update the tree. And also want to make sure that that member is in, a, in a, uh, an up status. So it's checking if it's up. And then if it's up, then it calls forward action, which is down here. And here I'm just building a, what's called an actor selection, which is like an actor reference, which is like an actor URL. So I'm just kind of taking the, the host name that I'm getting from looping through the lists of, of members and the path to the app actor, which I'm getting from my actor, and I'm just building a basically an act, act URL, and then I'm just doing a tell. So this is how, this is all the code that was required, these two little methods to do the, the cluster where piece. And this is what, how I uh, make sure the tree is updated across the cluster. This is used a lot, especially by some of the internal uh, ACA actors, but these, you know, as you can see, you know, this is just code I wrote. It's not rocket science. It's, it's really straightforward stuff to do. It's very, very powerful. So there's also singletons. Um, don't have really enough time to go into that. Um, the, this uh, cluster singletons is very well documented in the ACA documentation. But what I've been showing you is cluster sharding, and then cluster sharding is the foundation for um, for ACA persistence and ACA persistence query, which is event sourcing and command query responsibility segregation in ACA, a way of implementing command uh, event sourcing in CQS in ACA, which is, uh, that's a whole nother big, huge topic area. Um, maybe some of you are already using it. It's, it's very, uh, very powerful. It's often used in microservice environments um, and it's growing in popularity fairly steadily, I think. So this is kind of, uh, you know, hopefully showed you um, a little bit of um, why there's this love relationship between Akka and um, Kubernetes. Let's see if we ever got to five pods. Yes, there it is. <clears throat> so it finally came up. So. It, Back in the diagram. I, I, was, I was making a, uh, a small sacrifice to the demo gods <laughs> you, uh, in the meantime. So I'm, I'm glad this, I'm glad everything caught up. There you go. So I, let me just scale it back real quick and I'll be done. Uh, well, I'm gonna scale back to three again. We should see those two pods go away really quick. And then we should see the 15 shards, you know, the shards that were on those, you know, that they should, yeah, they're already there. I think we're maybe, uh, 
moving things around just a little bit. But the 15 shards kind of rebalance themselves. There you go, very quickly on the Aka side. So Kubernetes just scaled this back very quickly and then Aka reacted uh, to it very quickly as well. I don't know why, of course I had to fail me. So <clears throat> here's the URLs. We'll post um, the, the slides uh, from the talk. But the project that I was walking through is this first one. It's in my own private, uh, no, it's not private, my own GitHub repo. And um, it's just Gaka Java cluster Kubernetes. Got a readme file in it. Um, pretty thorough. I've, I've got a few more updates to do to it, but uh, I've used it in a workshop and, and a bunch of people were able to kind of work their way through it. Some did, people did OpenShift, you know, MiniShift, some people did Kubernetes, or did Minikube, and so on. There's also a series of six other projects that don't use Kubernetes, but kind of are along the same lines. And, and the, uh, the cluster sharding project from this six series was used to do the cluster Kubernetes project. But these are all made to be, you can git clone them, you can Maven uh, package them, and then uh, there's, uh, in the readme's, there's uh, examples of uh, some scripts that you can use to start up a cluster and play with them and look at the logs. They don't have the visualization piece yet, like the Kubernetes project does, but um, they're there. And the intent is to kind of take you from a very, very simple Java cluster project with like one simple actor, but it's like, okay, here's all the pieces that you need to build a cluster in Akka and Java and Maven, and then kind of builds up all the way to uh, event sourcing and CQS. Um, this O'Reilly book I did actually a couple of years ago now, uh, it's a general introduction to actor concepts, free to download, and we're done. All right, Hugh. Well, thanks for leaving a couple minutes for, for some questions. There's a lot of them. Um, let's see, first of all, uh, actually, I'd like to share one comment from uh, a gentleman who's joining us today who says, man, this looks like magic almost, too easy to believe. Yeah, so for those, of you, <laughs> for those of you on the chat right now, you'll notice that I just put a uh, link into Hugh's uh, GitHub repo uh, to that project so you can download it and play with it yourself. All right, let's get to a few questions. Um, does uh, Aka cluster does the Aka cluster demo that you're showing here include Aka persistence and Aka HTTP? It uses Aka HTTP. The um, it def definitely uses it. The Kubernetes one doesn't do persistence, but in the six, the last two in the series of six projects listed below, um, do do Aka persistence. So you have to run something like Cassandra to play with it. Okay, gotcha. Uh, there's a question about, uh, there's a gentleman out there who's using OpenStack servers. Uh, he has a, he asked whether you have any advice on how to run Aka clusters with Kubernetes. Um, is this a bare metal scenario or run on OpenStack or do you have a, a brief recommendation? Although I expect the response will be, it depends. Yeah, I mean, the nice thing is, if it's running Kubernetes, you're good, <clears throat> because that's the common denominator here. OpenShift is, you know, it's a, it's a great commercial offering, and it adds a ton of uh, you know, nice things to it, but at its heart and soul, it, it's Kubernetes. So for us, the, you know, for the Aka cluster, we just need Kubernetes. So as long as you have a Kubernetes environment, then we're good. Okay. Uh, there's a question about how Aka cluster uses the actor system to uh, determine which uh, supervisory roles. Uh, is it chosen using the lowest IP address for the coordinator? And how is the coordinator hopping avoided in case of Kubernetes doing a rolling update, for example? Well, the yeah, it's a really good question. But, but basically, there's always a, the only thing that we have is in Aka is a, is a leader, and the leader is only used to make decisions about state changes uh, of members in the cluster, is the way I understand it. So mm -hmm. the the leader is determined by, uh, I think it's lowest IP. And right. so when Kubernetes is doing a rolling update, each stage of the rolling update 
Kubernetes is actually waiting for, um, there's two probes that Kubernetes uses, a readiness probe and liveliness probe. And it, I think it's using the readiness probe to make a determination, all right, that this pod has come up, it's ready to run, you know, it's good, it's, it's ready to run, and then now it can move on to the next one. What's happening inside of Akka is that Akka is actually managing the liveliness and readiness probes, and it won't turn those on until the clusters come back to a good state, which means we've gone through some node trans you know, transitions. Maybe a, node is, a new node has joined the cluster and a node has left the cluster, you know, things like mm -hmm. that. So mm -hmm. it, it's using you know, Kubernetes. This is, a, again, the, the, the nice symbiotic relationship. Kubernetes by design has a sliding this and this build concept. And we were using this in our manage, cluster management to handle the transition of rolling nodes, you know, new, uh, new versions of the uh, nodes into the cluster and, and aging out the old one. But it's a step-by-step, -step, you know, bring up a new node when it's ready, it's ready to rock and roll, all right, let's move on, maybe shut down the old one, and so mm -hmm. on, you know, that type of thing. Now, uh, there's, a, there's a question about whether, is there a logum project that, that kind of shows, uh, demos the same features? And so I know that we're talking about Akka cluster specifically here, but in fact, Logum heavily utilizes Akka cluster. So in a in a way, is this is this similar to a Logum project? It's exactly some. In a way, we're looking at the bones of or mm -hmm. the anatomy of a Logum system. Underneath the and Logum, Logum is uh, obfuscating. Uh, Logum is obfuscating some of the the stuff that you were showing. Yeah, yeah. For example, in Logum. The, they're called persistent entities. And persistent entities, you know, when we write logon code, we're writing kind of the, the guts of an entity actor, you know, the business logic of an entity actor. So the, the persistent entity code is running in some kind of an entity actor. So when we're looking at the visualization that we saw in this demo, we're really seeing, like I said, the anatomy of a functioning live logon system. You know, and which is cool, I think, for people that are using logon you know, you could take this project, get it running, show people and say, this, okay, when your microservice that you guys wrote is running, this is what's happening. You kind of use the visualization to explain what's happening as you know, Kubernetes pods spin up and uh, persistent entity actors are running. And because a lot of these concepts are very abstracted or obfuscated, like you say, away from us as logon developers, because we don't have, you know, that's the whole idea for, for logon. We, we, we don't, have to uh, get that deeply involved in some of the mechanics of the internals. Okay, great. Uh, final question that we have time for today. Is there a, a certified Red Hat or OpenShift Akka image uh, that we can uh, refer people to? Not that I know of. Yeah. There could be. I know that we, we just released something on operatorhub.io which um, I know it's a, it's a incubating alpha stage project, but yeah. okay. Well, that's a good question to follow up on next yeah, time. Definitely. Well, Hugh, this was an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. It's great to see that the demo gods were eventually on our side. Uh, this <laughs> is what eventual consistency is all about, I guess. <laughs> yeah, uh, to our audience, <laughs> yeah. To our audience, thanks for joining us today. If you have uh, additional questions that weren't able to get answered, you can tweet at Hugh. It's uh, slash McKee, his last name, H, and the number three. That's written in the chat as well. So again, thanks, everyone, uh, for joining us today. And we'll catch you next time. Thanks again, Hugh. You're welcome. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>